to, to introduce you to these two bridges. And I'd just like to say what a pleasure it is for me to be here tonight and a privilege to be invited to design uh, and develop two bridges in what I class to be probably the most beautiful location I've ever worked in, uh, for sure. Um, I know that you're all eager to hear about the two bridges, but I think it's very important that I'll just take a few minutes of your time, probably about 10 minutes of your time, just to introduce you to who we are and why we feel we're qualified uh, to design these two bridges for you. Okay, so there we go, there's the design team, the right one crew, and that's me, number two, Steve Thompson. Now, I'm a director with Randolph in the major crossings team in of Randolph. And I've got over 30 years of British design experience. And I should be the design lead, or having the design lead up, up to now, will be for the detailed design. And of course, given the unique location we've got, the beautiful location I've talked about, we felt at the time we tendered it was extremely important to put a world class team together. Uh, and that's exactly what we've done. We've teamed up with uh, a renowned bridge architect, uh, nice architect, led by Monty Knight, uh, and also respecting the fact that there are potential moving bridges involved, uh, we've teamed up with uh, the leading mechanical and electrical engineering uh, firm called Eden Consulting, headed up by Mark and Flo over there. And of course, all of these individuals are very highly respected throughout the world in the British fraternity. Um, so who are Rambot, I hear you say? Uh, well, we're a multidisciplinary engineering design consultancy. We, we were established over 70 years ago in, in Denmark. Uh, but we have 300 offices uh, around the world. Now, I'm based in Southampton, in the UK. Um, and, but I actually live in Dorset, uh, in the UK. And I was pleased to see today when we drove through a little sign that says, Welcome to St George's, twin with Lyme Regis. Because Lyme Regis is very, very close to my home in Dorset. So I think we've got some sort of connection already just because of that. Um, but in Southampton, my design team specialises in what I class to be unique bridges, standalone bridges, bridges that move, uh, anything special, but that's what we specialise in. Um, and on the screen, you can see uh, at the moment is Queen Street Crossing. Um, for those of you that are familiar with the UK, it's, it's a crossing of the 3rd and 4th in Edinburgh, and it's a project that we recently delivered from my team here out of Southampton. Um, the reason it's on the screen there is a, it's a record breaking uh, structure, but it's, it's unique. The environment that it's in is it's a lot of heritage. Uh, there are three centuries of bridges there, so this is really special. The difficulty that we face as bridge engineers is that it's, it's sad to say the Queen's Crossing, the one that's nearest to us here, is a replacement to the little bridge there, the fourth uh, road bridge. And that was built in the 1960s. Uh, and unfortunately, in the 1960s, there were an awful lot of bridges, and you'll hear about that in a moment, there were an awful lot of bridges that were designed uh, with the best intentions, but were never expected to take the explosion of traffic, the increase of traffic. Uh, and you know, it's, it's a fact we have to replace the bridges, they don't last forever. Um, and of course, this bridge is in a severe environment, it's a strategic crossing, and there are similarities, you might say, to, to where we are here in Bermuda. And of course, we designed it, it was built on time and under budget, which is also a key point. But of course, that's a massive structure, it's not a record breaking structure, uh, and it's not appropriate for, for Bermuda, per se. But, the, the, reason, the reason I show you the, these next slides here is to give you a flavour of, of similar bridges that we have got a lot of experience with uh, as a team, as Randall, as Mars Architects, as Eden in a collaboration. We've worked together as individuals for over 20 years, and that first started with the Gates of Bridge on the top, so left hand corner. It's a very unique opening bridge uh, across the side of Newcastle. Uh, it opens up for us of a crash. Uh, we just sit to swing the bridge of Manchester there, and of course our 
University of Kosovo, New Zealand. And I think I'm using the word Shrine, New Zealand. Uh, so we have students working in, in far, far from places. Now, all these bridges are certainly unique visually, but what holds them all together is that they're all functional. We must do something. If they get people from NATO, from across all sides of the other, whether it be pedestrians, cyclists, traffic, uh, they all do that. Not only that, though, they're over major waterways of ships, so they all have to own them on a very, very regular basis for, for ship. So they're very functional. They're not saying to be durable, they need to be reliable, and the whole thing in common with all these bridges is that we don't really make a deal. We want to use tried and tested, simple mechanisms to open these bridges, and they all open them in the same, the same way with simple libraries. And that's important, uh, as you'll hear later on. Um, and of course, because, because they're unique, so they all become regional symbols, kind of like, if you like, something that the local population can be proud of. Um, just a quick exercise to show a few other examples of this collaboration over the years. Uh, all of these structures, they respond to their local, um, the, 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 they respond uh, to the, to the local requirements. Um, and that's why they're different. Some of them are very, very high profile sites like the ones you really bridge something in London over the Thames. And on our islands, they're in often extreme environments like the new bridge uh, at the Sea, the Miss Salon's there, the Shepherd Bridge. Just very quickly before we get on to talk about the bridges, it's important to say that as with every project that we deliver, we as a team set out to have a vision so that that vision meets the challenges, meets the constraints and the particular requirements and aspirations of the project. And that vision usually comes in two parts. The first part being the user experience. And one thing that I noticed immediately when I came to it to the new is that because of the process is here for these two bridges are the first major structures that someone sees as it comes to the new building. It's also the last thing that people see when they leave the new So it's a great opportunity here to create a local identity, something that we need to be proud of and, and become a welcome site, a welcome home to the new or a welcome back to the new or just a lasting memory for people to think, wow, to be used so successfully. And they they really pass the place and they know the place. And that basically wants to come back. So there's a recognition here that bridges can be more than just a bridge, more than just a route, more than just a crossing. They can also be a destination. Um, and I think that's important. And again, there's a possibility of two bridges quite close to each other, so they need to be less energy. Um, the second part, obviously, is um, probably arguably one of the most important parts of the way. Um, the bridges have to be the local constraints and challenges. We understand that. We might not be able to to him on a personal level 
and also benefits to the Bermuda and future generations. Uh, the carnival will bring back the technical skills that we obviously have, uh, and that's a major benefit, not just to the future maintenance of these bridges, but also for future projects. And of course, when the carnival gets to my right old age in the future, he'll hopefully be passing on that knowledge to future generations of engineers to, to maintain uh, your bridge stock. So, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ricardo. He's going to talk all about the project, and as we said earlier, there'll be plenty of time for, for any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Steve, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. It is my absolute pleasure to present to you some information on these exciting new bridge projects. Now, as the minister stated earlier, the two bridges that we're currently concerned with are Longbird Bridge and Swing Bridge. So for those of you that are unaware of their locations, Longbird Bridge is located directly at the end of the causeway, right before you get to LFA International Airport, and Swing Bridge is located at the end of Kimmy Field Road, near the roundabout on the Mother Bay Road side. Now, we have over 42 bridges in Bermuda, but these two bridges in particular may be the most important links that we have on the eastern end of the island. They're what's known as lifeline structures. So let's take a look into these structures a little bit more. At the location for the existing swing bridge, this provides a sole link between St. David's Island and St. George's. It crosses the channel between Stocks Harbor and Ferry Reach. Similarly, when you look at the location of the existing Longford Bridges and Longford Bridge and Navy Bridges, these provide a sole link between St. David's Island and Hamilton Parish. This crosses the channel between Castle Harbor and Ferry Reach. It is proposed that both of these bridges be completely replaced. Now, I know quite a few of you in the audience might be thinking, why do we even need to replace these bridges? Why can't we just repair the existing bridges that we have and potentially save the government some costs and some time? Well, there's one main answer to this question, and that is that the current and they're now beyond reasonable repair. If you take a look at the age of these structures, they average around 60 years per bridge. Longbird Bridge was built in 1954, and Swing Bridge was built in 1962. And since then, there has been various strengthening works that have been done to the bridges to try to remediate them to their original standing. But of course, the bridges are still in bad shape. They're beyond reasonable repair. I've had to do an inspection of the Swing Bridge quite recently, and I've seen firsthand the extent of the corrosion that we're getting on the underside and on the tops of those bridges. And this is quite evident in the images that you can see on the slide currently. Similarly, you have the temporary Navy bridges. These were installed in 2007, and these were only meant to be installed for a short amount of time. It's now 2018, and these temporary Navy bridges are still there. Now, the state of these bridges is not the one fault of any one person. It's the accumulation of various factors that has caused these bridges to deteriorate and end up in the state that they currently are. These involve the harsh environment that we had in Bermuda, the humidity, potentially the coding technology that was used back then is not as advanced as what we have now. The way that these bridges were detailed, they have sharp edges, they have quite a lot of corners, so it's quite easy for moisture and dirt to get trapped to accelerate the corrosion process. Now, as designers, we've had to come up with various different objectives and constraints to ensure that these bridges are fit for purpose. So let's take a look at some of the constraints that we've had to deal with so far. The first being aggressive climate. It should be no shock to any of you in the audience that Bermuda is a hurricane-prone country. We pretty much get hurricanes every year. We only recently just missed getting hit by Hurricane Florence a few weeks ago. So it's important that when we design these bridges, we ensure that these bridges are robust and durable enough to stand or withstand hurricane force winds. Bermuda is also remote. Our closest neighbor is approximately 650 miles away. So that means we need to consider the expertise, the equipment, and the materials used in this bridge because a lot of this will need to be sourced locally. And finally, Bermuda is a beautiful environment. I've had the pleasure of working in many different countries around the world and even traveling to many different countries around the world. And I must admit, there are very few countries that even rival the beauty that we have in Bermuda. 
Our landscapes are so serene, our culture is so unique, and our architecture is so vibrant. And that's why it's so important that when we design these bridges, we design them to fit well within our landscape. Now, let's take a look at some of our objectives. Of course, this is a bridge for the people, so we want to focus on the benefits that we can provide to users. And when I say users, I mean pedestrians, vehicular traffic, and marine vessels. These bridges also need to be robust and durable, and this ties back into the aggressive climate constraint. These bridges need to be able to withstand the test of time. The bridges also need to be simple to operate and to maintain, and this ties back into the remoteness constraint. We want to be able to have a local workforce that can maintain and operate these bridges without needing to gain the expertise from overseas consultants. There also needs to be some form of visual logic between the bridges, and that's because they're so close together. There needs to be some type of design synergy that almost makes the bridges like a family. And of course, these bridges are going to be gateway and landmark structures. These are some of the first structures that someone like a tourist or a local sees when they come into the island, and they're also some of the last structures that tourists and locals see when they leave. So this means that these bridges create a first and lasting impression of Bermuda. So it's important that when we design these bridges, they greet and they entice people to come to Bermuda, and that when they leave, it gives that lasting impression to show that not only is our environment beautiful, but so is our infrastructure. This also gives rise to allow us to create a local identity for these bridges. This allows us to incorporate our Bermudian essence into the bridge design, so that they're not just any old bridge. They end up becoming a destination that people actually want to travel to and go to. And of course, another important objective is the cost. As a designer, we want to maximize our value to the government so that they're getting the best bang for their buck. And this may be done by material selection or the geometric selection choices in the design process. And of course, where possible, we also want to improve and provide economies of scale. And this may be due to having, say, uh, certain bridge elements shipped on the same uh, shipment vessel to Bermuda, or potentially even using the same uh, equipment when they come in to start the construction. And finally, uh, of course, the environment. Like I said before, Bermuda is beautiful, and it's my honest opinion that when we design a bridge, it needs to reflect this beautiful environment and also be a beautiful and elegant structure. So let's take a look at the environment surrounding Swing Bridge. It's such a beautiful environment and it's so elegant, so it's important that when we design these bridges and input these bridges into this environment, it fits seamlessly. Take a look at the environment surrounding Longbird Bridge. This environment is also beautiful. You have the backdrop of the Grotto Bay Hotel houses, all those coral colors, you get the colors from the, the ocean, from the fauna, yet smack dab in the middle, you have a military gray bridge. Now, I know it's a, subject, a subjective question, but does this truly fit the environment? Perhaps not. And as a young bridge engineer, I feel that we can do so much better when it comes to designing and producing aesthetic bridges for our island. So, of course, as I said previously, one of the main objectives is providing benefits to the user. And we hope to do this in various different ways mainly by offering different safety improvements to the user. So we are proposing to offer wider carriageways. So for the traffic lane for the proposed replacement bridge, we would like to increase this to 11 feet 5 inches. You currently have 10 feet at the existing swing bridge. So this offers just a little bit more room to wiggle around uh, when you're transversing through the, through the bridge. We'll also be providing provisions for footways on both bridges. So for the swing bridge, there'll be a footway on either side of the bridge. And for Longbird Bridge, there'll be a footway on one side of the bridge, on the ferry reach side. And a relatively new concept we'll be implementing is a vehicle restraint system. This isn't found on any of the current bridges that we have on the island. But this is pretty much a system to prevent cars from driving directly off the edge, and it also prevents cars from impacting and hitting safety-critical elements of the bridge. Now, of course, it's not just vehicular traffic users and pedestrians that we want to provide benefits to. We also want to provide benefits to marine users. So if you take a look at this slide, this is showing the swing bridge alignment along with the marine vessel clearances. So if you look at the top image, this is showing the horizontal alignment of the swing bridge. 
The new swing bridge is proposed to be adjacent to the existing on the St. George's Harbor side by approximately five meters. And having it so close to the existing bridge provides many benefits to the taxpayer because it means that we do not have to realign the roads significantly, which saves quite a lot of cost. Now, when it comes to the benefits to the marine users, it's more relevant to take a look at the vertical alignment. When the bridge is in the closed position, we are proposing to have a headroom clearance above high tide of 13 feet, one inch. This is five feet, 10 inches higher than what we exist than what we currently had at the existing swing bridge. We're also proposing to increase the navigational channel width to 73 feet. This is 22 feet, 11 inches wider than what we had at the existing. So in a sense, this is future-proofing the bridge because it's allowing us to get larger vessels come through if need be in the future. Similarly, you have Longbird Bridge. The new Longbird Bridge will be, be will be placed in the exact same location as the existing Longbird Bridge. And of course, this will save costs from the realignments. Now, when you take a look at the vertical alignment for Longbird Bridge, we're proposing to have a headroom cover above high tide of 10 feet, which is six feet, two inches higher than what you currently have. We're also proposing to increase the navigational channel clearance width to 160 feet, nine inches, which is 78 feet, eight inches wider than what we currently have. Now, of course, when it comes to these bridge designs, we want to learn from the experiences of the past. We want these bridges to last. And we hope to do this by paying special attention to detail. So we've set these bridges with a 100-year lifespan. And we hope to achieve this by careful detailing. So this will be done by using a closed box to ensure that the internal elements of the bridge do not corrode, providing a curved soffit to allow free flow of water from not getting trapped onto the bridge. Avoiding corners and edges, which are moisture traps and dirt traps that accelerate the corrosion process. Providing a high quality and up-to-date coating system that is relevant to the harsh Bermuda environment. And finally, also providing offshore technology for all of the moving components of the bridge. Now, like I said, these bridges will be built to last. We don't want a repeat of what happened to our infrastructure in 2003 after the Hurricane Fabian hit. So we're proposing, of course, to raise the alignments of our bridges. Currently at Swing Bridge, the underside of the, the bridge deck is four feet, seven inches above high tide for Longbird Bridge and seven feet, three inches above high tide for Swing Bridge. We're proposing to raise the soffit height to 10 feet, of course, for Longbird Bridge and 13 feet, one inch for Swing Bridge. And this is mainly to avoid the effects of the, the storm surge from a one in 150 year hurricane. We feel that this proposed alignment finds the perfect balance between safety and cost for the government. Now, of course, it's not just the structural elements of the bridge that we want to be robust and durable. We want our mechanical systems and our electrical and hydraulic systems to last as well. So we're focusing on a mantra of using robust, uh, robustness, durability, reliability, and maintainability. So to ensure that this system is robust, we'll be offering simplicity of design and making sure that the equipment that we spec is conducive to our environment. To ensure that the bridge system is durable and reliable, we'll be reducing complex equipment setup and ensuring that maintenance can be carried out by local staff. And of course, to ensure maintainability, we'll be ensuring that these mechanical systems can be supported by local staff and that the local staff is trained so that they're able to highlight or predict faults before they even occur. So after a pretty extensive option study, there was one bridge that fit all three of these criteria, and that is a Baskill bridge. And this is what was chosen as the bridge type for the replacement for Swing Bridge. And this is quite a simple system. It's a very simple mechanical mechanism. All it has is two hydraulic cylinders that lift the bridge up. If one of the hydraulic cylinders needs to be replaced, the bridge will have a redundancy built into it so that one hydraulic cylinder can lift the bridge in an emergency situation. And the hydraulic cylinder that has a fault can be replaced at a whim. So this is the proposed form of the swing bridge. This is going to have a pivot underneath the deck and the lifting portion of the bridge will raise to almost 90 degrees, allowing vessels of any height to pass underneath. 
The proposed form of the Longbird Bridge will be a fixed bridge in the form of a tied arc bridge. Now, I know that the structural concepts between Longbird Bridge and Swing Bridge are quite different, but like I said before, they form a family, so there needs to be some type of visual logic and synergy between the two. And this bond will be achieved through curvature and color. Color is ingrained in our culture. You just have to look outside the window and all you see is color. Colorful houses, colorful fauna, colorful ocean, colorful sky. One of the first impressions that I got from the design team when they came to Bermuda was, wow, look at all this color surrounding us. So this is an aspect of Bermudian culture that we would definitely love to implement into these bridge projects. We use a color palette that's inspired by the whites and the pastel colors that are so commonly found in Bermudian architecture. So this is the first render of the bridge. And of course, these bridges are curvy. And that is one way that they synergize. The curvature for these bridges is driven by their function. So that's the durability and the robustness requirements of the bridge. However, the curves have been refined and, then be, and they've been referenced from nature. So we've taken a look to the spotted eagle ray that we sometimes see in Bermuda's waters. And the curves that we've inspired, that we've gotten and that's been inspired the form of this bridge are from the, the tips of the eagle ray as they taper and as they move along through our ocean. When raised, we want this bridge to be a spectacle. We want this to be an attraction. We want this to be something that people go to, like almost like a destination. So we want the public and we want tourists to be able to see the elegance of the bridge when it's in its raised state and when it's also in its closed state. And these bridges will be completely unique to Bermuda. You won't find bridges like this anywhere else in the world. When marine vessels pass, the bridge will take approximately four minutes to open and two minutes to close. And this just replicates the exact conditions that we had at Swing Bridge when it was fully operational. Of course, when the bridge is opening up, there'll be signals and warnings to ensure that pedestrians and traffic do not get caught in the center when the bridge is in the opening phase. When it comes to Longbird Bridge, this is also Curry Bridge. And like I say, that's, that's the familiarity between the two. That's the synergy. And this curve is also driven by the durability and robustness requirements for the bridge. The curve for this form was inspired by seashells and from the common sea turtle that we commonly see in Bermuda. There's been clever shaping of the arc so that when you look at the arc at different angles, you see different accentuations of the color. On this render, you can see some of the safety precautions that we're putting into the bridge, such as the vehicle restraint system. You can also see the pedestrian walkway. This, this image and this render shows the enhanced visual experience that motorists will get when they're crossing the bridge. It will give the illusion that they're passing through a gateway and they're passing through the gateway to get to paradise. Now, this structure will not only be beautiful by the roadside, but it will also be beautiful from the ocean side and from the air. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, how long is this this entire project going to take, and when is it going to take place? Well, some of the key milestones that we have here are, of course, the detailed design, which is the next phase. And we anticipate that that to take place in Q4 2018 to Q2 2019. We would hope to then go out to tender in Q3 to Q4 2019 with the construction start date of Q4 2019. Within the construction schedule, we hope to build both bridges at the same time. And this will be done in a 30-month period. Now, I can't stress enough that both of these bridges will be built offline. And what I mean by this is that the existing structures will be fully operational whilst these bridges are being built. And that means that we don't inconvenience the day-to-day -day traffic that we currently get crossing these bridges. Now, when it comes to these bridges, these aren't just my bridges, these aren't just the government's bridges, these are your bridges. So we want to include you as the public as much as we can along on this journey. So some initial thoughts that we've had to include the public inc involve a community walkover. So this is done in various different countries throughout the world when it comes to new structures. And this is just a collation or a collection of the community to come together to celebrate the milestone of Bermuda improving its infrastructure. This also allows the public to see the bridge opening for the very first time. We can also potentially engage local Bermudian artists. 
and this could be to perhaps get them to develop iconography through the bridges. So if we were to ever develop memorabilia or if we ever need to market these bridges, we would have some type of marketing platform to use. We also want to implement the local schools. I remember reading in the newspaper a little while ago that the schools are trying to implement a STEM curriculum. And I'm sure that this bridge project can be in implemented into that curriculum either by hands-on approach or by having the students come on for site visits during the construction phases. Of course, we can also engage local students, potentially have the local students design the new signs for the bridges that incorporate a Bermudian flair. Now, this concludes the information portion of the presentation, so thank you for listening. Like I said previously, these are your bridges, so please do use this time to raise any suggestions queries, questions, just anything that you think would be of help for this project, we would love to hear it. We have a technical representative from Ramble, we have government officials along with myself, who would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. So please do use this opportunity to, to voice your opinions. So please do, the floor is yours, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is John Steele. Can you give us an estimate for what it would cost to put the swing part of the swing bridge back? I'm not sure we need it, frankly, given that we've lived without it for 10 years or more. Uh, I mean, I appreciate it being raised. I think that's very valuable. And, uh, but the BIOS boat has managed to dock alongside BIOS for years. And I'm just curious if we're saving a million dollars or what, whatever it would be, if you could give me a ballpark, thanks. I'm not sure I understand your question. What is the, if you raise the actual swing bridge? If we don't have a swing bridge. Oh, it's fixed. Not if we have a fixed bridge. Yeah, the economy between the fixed bridge and the movable bridge will be somewhere around, let's say, on the total cost of the bridge, 40, 50% less. 30% to 40%, roughly. Good evening, thank you very much for that. Uh, I have some concerns about the Longbird Bridge being at too low an elevation, the height above water. Uh, you gave the example of storm surge, and that's more vulnerable and has a lower elevation compared to the Swing Bridge, which is much more protected. So I'd, I'd be interested to see you explore the idea of putting an arch for the Longbird Bridge so you have more elevation for larger vessels in transit under, underneath it and perhaps reduce their vulnerability uh, to um, the storm surge because it'll be at, at a higher elevation. Just to follow from that, another concern I have about the uh, Longbird Bridge is we're attaching it to our causeway, which is very vulnerable. So I think in making that investment for the Longbird Bridge, we have to think about what are the costs to fortify and strengthen the remainder part of the, of the causeway so that you, know, you can continue your journey from the new bridge back to the mainland. So thank you and uh, hope you can consider those points. Thank you for your question. It's a very good question, and the, the right answer will last one hour. And uh, you don't want to hear all of this, but I, I try to simplify what has been done after Fabian so you understand the causeway and the longer bridge. The, uh, after Fabian, a lot of study has been done to find the weakest point of the causeway. What's happening? Because the causeway has been built in 1860, and it failed in 1890. It fell again in 1995 during uh, Hurricane Felix and again against uh, in Fabian. So a lot of study has been done after Fabian. So we identified the two weakest point of the causeway. This is exactly the same point that they fell in Fabian. So the entrance at Grotto Bay and the Longbird Park. I, I skip a lot of technical detail, but in Nicole, the wind, the tide at 9.30 in the morning was the maximum wind and the maximum tide with the same wind direction that we had with Fabian, and nothing happened. So if you raise the, 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 the bridge a little bit over the surge the, of, the, of the ocean, and especially with global warming now, we have to, to be careful of that, and we have new data that we apply to that qualification. So we have to increase a little bit the, the size of the stone on each side, but the causeway, except for a little undermining on the central part, is in great shape, and it will be able to sustain any 
uh, any hurricane on, 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 on excuse me in 150 years. But again, if you have a, a wind of 100 miles per hour, the causeway will not be safe to cross like any road in Bermuda. Can I just add to that? There was a, a second part to your question about the, the heights, and you're absolutely right that uh, Longbird Bridge is potentially the, the more vulnerable. But um, the, the, there's, a, there's a reason why Swing Bridge is that little bit higher, because it is an opening bridge. It, it has the hydraulic cylinders. We want to make sure that those are, uh, are outside of that vulnerable uh, location as well, so they're not inundated. So that's the only reason why that might, it potentially looks like it's been raised higher. It looks like the, the arches on this long work period are just merely decorative. And the gentleman just now was talking about the bridge itself being raised so that boats could get out of the meter. If that was the case, then we could have a bridge that actually has a curve, not as high as that, and that curve, which is functional, would probably be as attractive as this decorative thing that you got there. <laughs> uh, well, please let me reassure you, there's, there's nothing on this structure that is there purely for decoration. It, it has been enhanced to improve the visual um, aesthetic for sure we've you know we've elevated the arch that little bit higher and and played with the curvature but there's no real you know cost element to that but if but the bridge had curvature to allow boats to get up wouldn't that make it more attractive looking? well the, the the bridge will have curvature but um you've got limitations on the gradients that traffic will is allowed to to follow as well uh, and Believe me, that, that structure only works because it has those arches uh, in place. But we've, we've used the shaping to, to make it prettier than, than, than other arch bridges, you know, to make it more of a gateway, to make it more, uh, you know, to, so to why take references. Have an arch, that arch and the other bridge, bridge Sorry, I didn't understand the question. The other bridge is bigger and doesn't have that, and this is small and has it. The other bridge doesn't have an arch, this arch, and you're saying that's part of the... Oh, yeah, yeah, the, so I understand. this has an arch, why doesn't the bigger bridge... No, the, 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 swing bridge, the swing bridge is longer, but the spans are, are smaller. This is quite a large span. So and it's, it's necessary to... Absolutely, build. absolutely. Um, building on the previous um, questions, you say you evaluated you know, vehicle, pedestrian, and boat traffic at both bridges to determine what was needed. However, if you evaluated the boat traffic within the last few years at Longbird Bridge, that's not representative of the boat traffic that would and should be going there. Um, you know, a lot of the marine tourism operators have actually stopped going into Castle Harbor, not because they didn't want to, but because they couldn't, because they couldn't go through the bridge. If the bridge was actually bigger, more and a greater variety of tour boats would be able to get through. But from my perspective, um, I, I work at Fisheries, full disclosure. We had somebody from the airport come and talk to us the other day about whether our fisheries vessels would be able to get into Castle Harbor in an emergency to help rescue people if a plane went off the end of the runway. Hypothetical situation, but clearance of more than three foot, three meters and 30 centimeters is probably gonna be important if you want emergency vessel access into Castle Harbor. Yes, thank you for your question. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. But for Longbird Bridge, again, what we, in the evaluation, when we had the three options to put the Longbird Bridge movable, the cost of that was prohibitive for the added value that we had. That's the conclusion we came, we came to. And at, at the end of the day, we have to, to get the best value for money. And this is, this is the conclusion we, we, we went to. Sorry, just 
to clarify, I don't actually think it would be a good idea to have Longbird Bridge movable, but I would like to see a greater degree of clearance on a fixed structure because I think that would be important. Thank you. That's <laughs> so. Let's we'll check we'll check the eyes with the the design team and we'll 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 have a close look at that. Good evening. My question is my question is what what is it going to be the massive tonnage that's going to drive across these bridges? The bridge. Oh, you mean the, the tonnage on the bridge? You know, to drive across, like vehicles going across, it seems like people don't pay attention to that. Yeah. Right now we have... Yeah. Yeah. capacity. Yeah. Right now the capacity that we have on the bridge is 30 tons and 10 tons per axle. And in Bermuda you have to figure out also, the bridge are critical in terms of tonnage, but the roads also are. We don't use sub-base here, so the capacity of our road are also limited. So we cannot open the tonnage to the city, 45, 50 tons. So the bridge will be built to have, uh, of course, higher tonnage, but our intention for now is not to change the tonnage that will be allowed on the road, and it's not Ministry of Public Work, it's Ministry of Transport. Because that's very important because I, I, I used to operate crane, I used to deal with weight all the time, and some, somehow to me, people don't pay attention to weight, especially when it comes across a bridge. They don't pay attention to that. You will have to come with, to work with us because, because we're, we're trying to discipline people <laughs> just to make sure we... Yeah, because that's very important. Yeah, very important. And on the actual swing bridge, it's fixed. And we had very, uh, a lot of problem and technical challenges to correct some of the issues that were created by overloaded truck that are uh, passing on the swing bridge. During the construction process, the the uh, the uh, construction process, yeah. yeah, the swing bridge will not be operational. That's the actual swing bridge, so nothing will be changed in terms of marine traffic. On the Longbird Bridge, the actual bridge that is is very unsafe right now will be demolished this fall to make sure that we make it safe. So during the construction, the uh, it will have to be uh, tackled with the contractor. I, we cannot answer at this time, but the the uh, We'll try to, uh, depending on the, on the timing of the construction, when we did the abutment. But with the span we have, I'm sure we're going to be able to acclim acclimate some, some marine traffic. And just to come back to your question with the height of the bridge, and the, the, the important point also that we have to keep in mind is the, the, uh, the slope of the, of the approach. We have to link into the roundabout on the other way. So we can lift the bridge, but at one point the slope will be so steep that we cannot link on the, on the roundabout. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to optimize, and it's, uh, it's our intentions to raise the causeway on both hands, because more we raise it, the safer it is. But at, at one point, we cannot go into the airport, at, with the, and we have to be back on the right alignment, so to be straight. We don't need a curve on the bridge, so we'll, we'll, this, this is the, the, uh, the limit that we can, we can lift the bridge with the slope on the other end. The person that have the wallet in this room sitting right there. So the the. Uh, <laughs> I've been in this game long enough that if I give a figure tonight, it'll come back to haunt me. We're not prepared to do that until we actually have the detailed designs of the bridge and the material that it's going to um, be used to build the bridge. We won't. We're not going to come with a figure. And, and, and I don't have permission or approval to build it. Um, and so, not at this stage. At the end of the phase three, which is what we're entering now, we will have a figure about what it will cost. Of course, that will be driven like everything that you build. It depends on when you actually pull the trigger. Because if we wait four years, the price is liable to go only in one direction. But I can assure you right now what we're looking at, and it's very important, Ricardo mentioned that we are losing, looking at new technology. We're using it right now at the ministry and we have uh, huge savings. So it depends a lot on the procurement methods, where it's going to be prefabricated to use the maximum of our local contractors to get the best competition. And we're going to look at those several options with, with in-house, with OPMP to find the best procurement methods. 
and, and we will try to get the best value for money. And again, after the design, we will know exactly what is the cost. Okay. Uh, it's interesting that you added a walkway on the side of the uh, Long Bridge. How are you going to attack the rest of the causeway? <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's another. That's an excellent idea, because that's what we've been, that's yeah. what people have been needing for, for years. Yeah, that's, an, that's actually, we're studying that right now. That's one of our other projects, if we still have some money to do it. Like I mentioned, the causeway structurally is, is in good shape. Some undermining, but globally it's fine. So now we're looking at a, a solution to put a bike path or a, a, a walkway on the side of the causeway. It needs to be structurally feasible. We're doing the, uh, we're looking at the feasibility right now. If we have the money to do it and it's doable, I think it will be logical to do that. But again, we we uh, we, we need to have the, the 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 money. So if we can save on the procurement of the bridge, and first of all, we need to see if it's doable. We think it is, but uh, we need to look at it carefully. Um, it's, it's a good question and certainly one that we, we, we will study as part of the design. Uh, wind loading is, is extremely important. Um, we have done initial studies to indicate that uh, the structure is, is stable during even hurricane winds, so we haven't got any concerns at the moment, but it's certainly something that will be uh, studied in detail as part of the detailed design, as we do with all the bridges. We'll be doing the same with the arch bridge as well. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a function of our design role. Oh, no, there, there will be limits on, on the operation of the bridge, but yeah, it, it is a sale. But then there will be operational limits for opening a swing bridge because what you can't allow is for a swing bridge to be uh, swinging free in, in, high, in high winds. So yes, there will be a limit on, on the wind speed during, during opening. Um, where will the um, swing bridge be operated from? Will it be operated remotely or will it be manned? The, the current intention is that it will be manned and um, the location of where the operator stands uh, is, is currently under discussion but there's a thought that it should be uh, close to the north side, uh, pretty much where the, the existing north abutment is of the existing bridge. But there will be option. The, 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 it's a discussion that we will be having with the, uh, the, the client, and there'll be there'll be um, ability to operate it uh, on the bridge. There'll be maintenance points as well within the bridge, so there'll be a few places where it can be operated. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it is likely that it will be on that north side, close to where the, the existing uh, bridge house is. To be honest. Have you discussed the possibility of operating it remotely? Uh, we have discussed it, yes, absolutely, uh, there, and there, there's, there's lots of technology out there and potential out there. So any more questions? I guess that's concludes our presentation, and again, like Ricardo mentioned, if you have any question, any thoughts, you can email us or call us. It's it's a pleasure and uh, thank you very much to, uh, to have come tonight. Thank you.